Hello, Internet, and welcome to the final vacation edition of One Minute Answers from One Minute Economics, an edition that's going to be dedicated to democracy. But before getting started with the three questions I have lined up for today, I want to do the following. One, as usual, pick the topic for next week, and the topic for next week is going to be retirement, and I really hope that young people are going to also ask me questions because there's no such thing as an age at which you should say, I don't care about retirement, it's too soon. So if you're a young person, who wants to know a thing or two about retirement planning, feel free to ask me or the same way. If your retirement is a lot closer and you want tips as well, please ask whatever's on your mind by writing a comment below and I will do my best to answer next week. Two, I want to also remind you guys that my new book is almost finished. It's a book that's going to help people prepare for financial calamities like, you know, a stock market meltdown or stuff like that. So I, it's, a, it's a book that I think everyone should read. It's a book that's, you know, about stuff that affects you no matter how hard you want to live in your own bubble and say, yeah, I don't care. I just do my job. I just live my life. No, these things affect you. And in my opinion, people need to become knowledgeable about things that have to do with resilience, with spotting financial storms and all that good stuff. So if you can, I would really appreciate it if you could give me not one minute, but five seconds of your time by heading over to oneminuteeconomics.com and subscribing to my newsletter. It only takes a few seconds. I promise I won't spam you. I will simply let you know when my book is live. The first question for today has been asked by Pratmish, who would like to know what I think about the effects of democracy on the economy of a region. And, okay, first of all, I think it's important to understand that it's always difficult to say, okay, this particular region is doing better than this particular region, thanks exclusively to democracy. It's never like that, and in the world of economics, things are always ridiculously complex. There are all sorts of other aspects to think about, demographics, geopolitics, and whatnot. But all in all, it is easy or relatively easy to draw some parallels and we have like for example situations that involve comparisons between countries like mine like Romania that used to be under the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union so countries that used to be behind the Iron Curtain so to speak and Western countries and you cannot help but take a look at things like GDP growth and notice that of course a lot of other factors being considered, democracy tends to be a good thing, you know, historically speaking, for the region in question. And that leads me to always telling people something along the lines of what uh, Winston Churchill is credited as saying, in that, okay, democracy is not perfect, there are lots of stuff people might consider frustrating about it, But yeah, it's the worst option aside from all of the others that we have. So to put it differently, it's, in my opinion at least, the best choice by far. And while it's never possible to attribute the success of a country or of a region or of a continent or whatever exclusively to democracy, we can take a look at what history has to say. We can look at things like GDP growth. And I do believe that there's overwhelming data that shows... You know, the fact that even with all of its limitations, democracy is, after drawing the line, a net positive. The second question for today has been asked by Joshua, who would like to know if democracy in economics is different compared to the textbook definition of democracy. Now, this is a tricky and at the same time loaded question because in the world of economics, you frequently come across situations in which you notice that systems that are completely undemocratic in nature function very well. Like, for example, I'm sure you can think of a very successful business that's run by a strong-armed business leader who always decides, okay, we have to do this, we have to do that, it's my way, I'm the owner, I decide, I don't care what you think. There are a lot of companies that are run in this manner and which produce excellent results. And on the one hand, you cannot help but notice the fact that the companies in question are doing very well, but on the other hand, you also notice that they're being run in a way that's not exactly democratic because the owner doesn't 
you know, contact all stakeholders and ask, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Let's vote and decide what we have to do together. No. In a lot of situations, companies that do very well, companies that are very successful are being run in a if you will, dictatorial manner. And one of the most frustrating things to me as an economist who likes democracy, who likes, you know, the, the idea that people can vote for leaders who represent them, who thinks that it's a privilege to live in a democratic world, it's sometimes difficult for me to reconcile the fact that I like democracy with the observations I frequently end up making that in the world of economics, you do come across systems that are anything but democratic, but which function properly. So if you're, think if you're interested about being an economist or if you're interested in, I don't know, studying economics in general, you have to, let's say, have a proper stomach for this because, yeah, if you're not able to take a look at data and situations that contradict your current beliefs, then you're not going to be a very good economist. And personally, while I do believe that democracy is the best option for society, and I'm maybe going to make a series of videos through which I, art I articulate why I believe that, I am always willing to listen to all sorts of different viewpoints, I'm willing to study all sorts of systems, because in the end, that's what us economists are here to do. And for today's final question, Bruce asked if it's fair that in a democracy, absolutely everyone gets to vote, including, of course, people who aren't exactly knowledgeable when it comes to how things work in politics. Now, I believe it's vital to realize that the answer to such a question is inherently going to be subjective because the idea of fairness itself is highly subjective. So, for example, someone who receives more from the state than what he gives to the state is quickly going to say, sure, of course, democracy is fair, everyone gets to vote, what is their comment? On the other hand, someone who, let's say, makes a lot of money and pays a lot of taxes, so someone who gives more to the state than he receives in the form of medical services, infrastructure, and so on, might be tempted to say, wait a second, it's not fair that I have to pay all of this money and other people who receive more than what they give to the state can simply vote for politicians that promise them free stuff. So, yeah, it's definitely a tricky situation, but I believe that this entire discussion brings us right back to my answer to question number one, which is the fact that, yeah, democracy is definitely not perfect, but let's just say it is quite accurate to call it the worst system we've had, aside from all of the others that we've tried. So, yeah, it's not perfect, but it tends to be better than the alternatives. So with that instated, so with that stated, while there is a case to be made that some things about democracy aren't necessarily fair and even more so yeah, from the perspective of those who uh, give more to the state than they receive. They can be considered frustrating, but all in all, I do believe that based on the data we have so far, it's fairly safe to consider democracy the best option we have at this point, and all in all, with it being the option that tends to make society as a whole better off, then even if there are things that we personally don't find all that exciting about democracy, it's probably wise to just, you know, accept them as inherent flaws in the system that's still better than the alternatives. That's it for today, guys. Thanks a lot for tuning in to yet another edition of One Minute Answers from One Minute Economics. And remember, one, the topic for next week is retirement. So whether you're a young person who is kind of sort of thinking about when he should start planning about retirement, or of course, if you're older and want some specific tips about what you need to do, whatever may be on your mind, simply ask me by writing a comment below and I will do my best to answer next week. Number two, my book is almost finished, so if you can, please give me five seconds of your time by heading over to oneminuteeconomics.com, typing in your email address, and subscribing to my newsletter. It's ridiculously easy, and I promise I will simply email you so that I can announce the launch of my book. 
As usual, please like my videos, comment, and subscribe to One Minute Economics if you haven't by now. And those who want to support the channel financially and can afford to do so can buy my Wealth Management 2.0 book or donate through PayPal, Patreon, or Bitcoin. More info can be found at OneMinuteEconomics.com. Thanks a lot, guys, and have an awesome weekend.